the surprise ending. After you either read or heard chapter 8, I'm sure you're a bit perplexed. Albeit that I try to be a man of not a lot of words, the answer of nothing seems impossible. But that's the way this game is played, you see. They know in Washington, what I know sitting right here, that you just learned, if you can't read or listen to the rest of the book, at least you can comprehend chapter 8, the word nothing. But the key is what can I do as an individual? You see, together, we can change the country back. We can move it back to everything we ever wanted it to be. More importantly, we can get rid of the scum, the trash that's occupying our seats and our Congress. Seats that were set up originally intended to be seats that were representing us. Our forefathers even made it pretty clear, don't let special interest into politics. Because they knew if you did, that those interests would develop laws to protect their interest, not that of the nation. Another little sidebar that you might find kind of interesting, our forefathers didn't want us to put attorneys in office. They probably thought less of attorneys in those days than they did witches, and they didn't like witches. You know, their whole concept was lawyers are leeches on a society. But no, we put them in. And then we wonder, why do we have what's known as the black robe mob? Now we have judges that conduct courts, make rulings that overrule our Congress. You know, Constitution did say, Congress shall make all laws. It didn't say lawyers or judges could. We let it happen. And for that, we will pay. And for that, it makes it even harder to change things. But I'll tell you this. Just like in the Revolutionary War, there weren't that many people back then jumping out there and getting on a mess of fighting. It was actually quite a small number. Oh, everybody profited, everybody jumped up and down and yelled once the war was won. But it was 4 to 10 percent of the people, the only ones that did the fighting. And that should be a lesson for us. We don't have to have everybody. But we can't do it alone. The war in Iraq. The war in Iraq is a mess. It's truly a mess. When you go back to the chapters in this book, you find out that the war in Iraq was a combination of some people being pretty calculated. Tenet, trying to lead Bush astray, to get us to go one country too far. The oil companies trying to close down Hussein from backhauling oil to France, Germany, China, and Russia because they wanted those markets. As a matter of fact, it's hard to find much right about the war in Iraq, except that our greatest living lineage to true patriotism. They're over there fighting. We can't turn our back on them. We also don't need to tell the terrorists that we're going to turn tail and run. Because there we're in a war against Muslims, the Islamic faith. And the unintended consequences of just starting a war that made Bush look bad or starting a war just so the oil companies can get back a market that they lost has put us right square dab in the middle of a religious war. You see, if we leave, all the Islamic people are going to say their God 
is the true God. And they'll become emboldened, empowered. Now, if we stay and whoop them, well, we don't have to worry about their God because the only way you truly whoop them is kill all of them. Ain't nobody left to worship Allah. And because of the war over there, we're not tending to business here. I mean, we've got Mexicans coming across the border by the hundreds of thousands a month. And whatever jobs we've lost to outsource or haven't lost to outsourcing offshore, the skilled labor jobs that were left that at least Americans could do, illegal Mexicans are doing them. And nobody's doing a thing about it. And we're sitting here worried about not if, but when we get hit again by terrorism. Can I tell you all a little secret? You see, George Bush came out talking about the bird flu, H5N1, avian flu. Well, folks, it'd be 150 years before <clears throat> that virus could naturally on its own, without a little help from its friends, developed from bird to human, human to human. Now, what George Bush is trying to do is to get us prepared for a true pandemic, but not one brought here by birds, one brought here by terrorists. And what better cover, right? What better way to cover it up? Because if we found out that a terrorist dropped a bottle of a virus downtown Los Angeles, the country would go into a panic. People would die. Economy would be destroyed. The terrorist would win. We could never admit that. It would be suicidal to do so. So I got the ticket. Here's what you do. Let's blame it on this mysterious virus that's coming here from ducks. And that way, if the terrorists do pop off a virus, we'll be able to say it wasn't terrorists, so don't panic. And we'll claim it's bird flu or stars or SARS or whatever they call it. You see, folks, we don't really know anymore. How many terrorist attacks have already taken place in this country? Maybe some, maybe none. But one thing is absolutely dirt crazy straight. Our government don't tell us the truth anymore. None of them. We have no idea the shape we're in. Hey, you believe the people in New Orleans... Well, remember when it was hot, when the media was talking about those poor people in New Orleans? And all you could hear, because FEMA had dropped the ball, Congress got together and they started saying, hey, this is going to be $200 billion and we're going to make cuts and we're going to do all this. Well, like most things in politics, people have short memories. Time has passed since then. There's been a football game or two since then. It's not that big of a deal anymore. And ain't much cutting going on in Washington to pay for all that stuff down in New Orleans anymore. It's not. Because it's not an issue now. The oil companies, I mean, don't you find it quite incredible that we cannot get our government to hold an investigation into the pricing and potential of price fixing from the oil companies? <clears throat> You've got reason. I mean, withstanding the fact that they've made Buku profit by getting back those foreign markets. But remember when Hurricane Katrina hit? Folks, it had not touched the shore yet. And in your hometown, your gas prices started going up. Go figure. Don't you think somebody ought to ask that question? Don't you think somebody ought to say, well, maybe Exxon got hit by Katrina, but did Chevron? 
because they all went up on their prices. Well, that meant they must have all equally got hit with as many refineries and oil wells that each one of them exactly all went down in the same amount because they all raised their prices. I mean, doesn't it bother you that Congress won't even investigate it? Does it not bother you that we do already suffer from a pandemic? Unemployment. You know, when you lose your job and you've committed your family to a house payment, car payment, school payments to the kids, clothes for the kids, when you lose your job and in your community there's not any more like it, you ain't dead. But you ain't living. Don't you think somebody in Washington should say, let's go back and let's reevaluate NAFTA and GAP? I mean, shouldn't somebody call a hearing and look at the realities of what's happened and take charts and go back and look exactly since the day it passed? Look at the transfer of wealth. When NAFTA GATT passed, multinational corporations on the stock market, they started making money. The little guy down at the street, the employee lost. Don't you think somebody in Congress ought to come up with a concept about our borders that actually makes sense? Let me give them a suggestion. How about plagiarism here on Nancy Reagan's part? But here's a good concept. Just say no. You ain't coming in. If you are here, we got people driving around. They're going to catch you, and they're going to send you back. And then go around and say to employers, you hire illegal Mexicans. Anybody illegally that's not legally here. And you're going to be fined into going out of business. Now you say, well, it's pretty radical stuff you're talking there, Larry. No, it's not. See, I I have a problem understanding how Congress and the Senate and the President I mean, how can they ignore the key word, an illegal alien? Illegal. Well, we can't fight the ACLU. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Just tell the ACLU where to go. The word is illegal alien. Now, if it's not bad enough that we in this country have lost all of our rights, illegal Mexicans and other illegal people coming into this country have more rights than we do. I mean, can can we not change this? Well, there you just spent chapter and chapter talking about how everything's crooked. Well, yeah, it did. I mean, do you not think we can sit here with oil for food? Now, you, you know, I said in this book, that oil for food started in 96, thanks to one lady named Hillary. He said, but ah, you can't prove that. Well, let me explain something. Do you know what oil for food means? It means you get a voucher. Now, this voucher's good for 10 buckets of oil. Present this voucher and get your money. Kind of like futures, commodities. And people get these vouchers. Good for 10 buckets of oil. They cash that voucher in and they get money. But Larry, how can you make a statement that the Clintons helped develop that thing? Are you sitting down? Bill Clinton was president. He appointed ambassadors to the U.N., we had people all over the U.N. The U.N., by the way, is in New York City. And we find out just a few days ago that there were over 2,200 U.N. people that were involved, we now know, in an all for food scandal. 
Now with the CIA, with the State Department, with the every other kind of FBI and every other kind of I there is, do y'all really believe, do you believe it's possible that a system this pervasive they're not taking the people in this country that are in on it. I'm just talking about the 2,200 that were over there. Folks, you had to be, you'd have to go in the bathroom, shut the stall, turn the lights out, and cover your head with a sack not to have known that everybody was jumping on that gravy train. And if you believe the Clintons didn't hear about this racket that was going on over there, especially when, of course, we were supposed to be monitoring Iraq. Me you know Hussein wasn't supposed to be selling oil. It is impossible, don't you see, that our government, especially our president, was not informed back then about what was going on. He knew. They knew. But they put a clever little twist to it. They called it leverage for barter. Leverage for barter, which meant basically we can catch people getting them vouchers and we can barter with them, make a deal. I know you got vouchers and I want to be the head of the U.N. I know you got vouchers. I want Hillary to run for president and she's going to need some money. And by the way, the money's going to have to come in a little slippery because it's a foreign government. Don't you think somebody in Congress, there's bound to be two or three of them, enough to at least get a quorum, should investigate not only who's in it, but cause you see, <laughs> they're not going to investigate who's in it. Because they're in it. They're in it with their families, their distant cousins, or companies that you've never heard of that supposedly can't be leaked to them. But nobody's looking at how did it happen? How could our intelligence agency, as much as 9-11 was a fiasco of intelligence, how could our intelligence community that was working 24-7 to keep Saddam Hussein under wraps, under these sanctions, to keep him in the penalty box, how in God's name could they not have known a scandal of this magnitude was going on in the U.N. So, yeah. Problems. Problems. And they're big problems. But I titled this chapter The Surprise. Surprise ending. We can make it better. We can stop this madness. This chapter don't take a lot of talking because there ain't much we got to do to stop it. You see, all we've got to do is go to the ballot box this next election and everyone from now on. And from dog catcher to president. See a Democrat? Forget it. See a Republican? Forget it. See a constitutional party, forget it. Libertarian party, forget it. Said so ain't hard. We ain't had to do nothing except just nothing. But if you see somebody down there as an independent, vote for him. You say, well, oh, Larry, we can't do that. Because we don't know. See, that independent's not going to have any money. Not going to be able to run a campaign. To beat an incumbent, you've got to have one and a half times the amount of money they got in their coffer to even stand a chance of beating them. And they got so much money in their coffers, you can't even possibly get a half a time as much as they got, much less, much less one and a half. Let me ask you this. What difference does it make? I mean, you don't know it's independent. He might be the till of the hunt. He's better than what we got. It might be Al Capone reincarnated. It's better than what we got. As my old friend Bill Bo Shear says, if you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get 
which you always got.